Okay, it's just gone six o'clock and welcome to Access Europe June 2023 session and today I'm pleased to see that on the fourth leg of their world tour we have Tom Van Stiffel and Kim Young who are going to be doing a session about a specific aspects of the new Northwind 2.0 developer edition and it is the fourth of these sessions there's at least two more to come as I say they're focusing on different aspects of the Northwind developers template now and for those who don't know Tom is the lead developer for kineticit.com uh, you got the website there and he's been an MVP since 2008 Kim is another member of the Northwind 2.0 development team there were five of them in all and Kim it was the is the basically founder of Axis All Stars Chicago area of the United States and was also the vice president of the Chicago Axis user group which I think am I right Kim in saying is dormant at the moment yes it is I hope it will start again and Kim uh, there is details on the website there I'm going to let them talk about themselves properly in a second here so I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to Tom and Kim and if you could share your screen anytime from now hello everyone uh, delighted to be here again indeed this is the fourth uh, installment of our, our roadshow and today we'll be talking mostly about inventory and string functions of the you know, Northwind 2.0 development that was completed just about uh, a month ago when we went live with the 2.0 templates. Uh, you're looking here at the developer edition. As you probably already know, we have two editions. We have a starter edition for people who are new to access and just want to know a little bit about what it is. There's a lot of documentation for them to get up to speed and a very simple application that lacks some of the features that we'll be delving into today. Uh, but it does also have, you know, orders and products and the, uh, customers, that kind of thing. But in a simpler fashion, it doesn't have inventory, for example. Inventory just magically appears and never runs out because the idea is to have a showcase there. It's not a, an application for any particular business. And, and and so is the dev edition, but it does have a lot of things that I think developers are interested in. This template certainly has a lot of news, new things that were done for the first time with this template. And we'll be delving into a few of those. And if you go back to some of the earlier videos, then you will indeed get introduction in, for example, the ribbon, which we will use, but not really talk about. I'm here today with my co-presenter, Kim Young, who is one of the, the five that put this together over the last 16 months. And she will be kicking off the inventory module. Um, Tom, do you want to tell them a little bit about how this project got started? As probably some of you know, Northwind has been a pain in the side of many access MVPs and other professional developers. If you look at the database design of that previous version, there's a lot to be desired. If you delve into how it was put together, some of the code that is there, there's a lot that could have been better. And it was from 2006, and there was no way... Uh, no easy way to, you know, bring that data up to today. So if you wanted to run a report, you had to run it for the first quarter of 2006. And that just feels wrong. So we, we came up with a list of things that we wanted to do. And I have over the years uh, contacted the, the Microsoft project manager to say, hey, maybe this is a community effort that we could help you with to build a new version of, of Northwind templates. And at least two of them that I remember said no. We're busy with other stuff. We're not that interested in it without going into too much detail. The last guy, Michael Aldrich, who's also part of our team, he said yes. And so then it was, oh, wow, now we actually have to go do this. We have to put a band together to get people enthusiastic about this. We have to write the scope of work. We have to first internally agree on what it is we're doing. And that took a while as well. Eventually, you know, we got to that point and we started writing specs. Uh, this was a collaborative effort across the board. And this is the end result. In total, my guess is that really probably about 20 people or so contributed to this. We will be able to talk about some of that uh, in an upcoming blog post. Uh, there's really a lot of people who contributed here who uh, did, for example, the video. 
that we're not going to show today, but if you start Northwind, you will be able to see a video. There are people who have worked on accessibility and, and many other aspects of it. Only because of that group effort do we have the product that you're looking at today. I just want to really thank Tom for his persistence in getting this project to happen. He was not deterred with each no he received until he finally got a yes. So without him, this project would not have happened. And I'm very grateful that I got to be a part of it because I said something during the Vienna DevCon and Michael Aldridge said, well, do you want to help out? And I thought that meant just give my opinion, not actually be part of the team. So that was a big bonus when I found out that I would get to help be a part of this. So let's get started talking about inventory. So that you know a little bit about my background, I have a certificate in production and inventory control from DePaul University, and I received my Lean Six Sigma Black Belt certification from the University of Illinois. So I know a great deal about inventory. Um, I am by no means an expert. It is a huge, huge topic. If a customer was to come to me and say, I would like you to help us build an inventory application, I would say, great, let's get your requirements and then we'll start looking at products. Um, I would not be interested in attempting to build an inventory application. And I'll share with you some of the things that you may not have thought about, but that are questions you would have to ask. It is a very complicated topic. So I'm going to close this navigation pane so we can have the most amount of the screen showing. We're going to start looking at this from the perspective of the products. Without the product you sell, whether it's services, goods, you don't really have a business. That's kind of the hub, the heart of it. So this is our list form. And here we have a column called available to sell and reorder level. And if you'll notice, they're highlighted in yellow. The yellow indicates you need to take action because the available to sell is less than the minimum quantity you expect to have on hand. So it's telling you, you only have seven, you need to do a sale. This is a reorder level. Nothing happens in Northwind because of it, but we'll talk about that in a moment. To simplify our discussion, we're just going to look at one product, almonds. So we're going to walk through some of the data points. So here we have a product code, which is a self-generated value, meaning there's no industry standard for us about what that product code should look like. You can, op you can think of the Northwind version as a stock keeping unit. There are other sorts of identifiers, UPC codes, which is a universal product code. It is uh, authorized through a global standards organization. There are rules about how it is formatted. It must be all numeric, et cetera. There are global trade identity numbers, which you can use a UPC and you simply place a zero in front of it. For those of you in Europe that are listening, you have your European article numbers, if you want to sell on Amazon, I just learned this. I don't have any clients doing this, so I don't have very much to offer. But Amazon requires that you have a UPC, and then they issue what they call an Amazon standard identification number. You'll have many, many manufacturing codes if you actually manufacture a product. They are internal product numbers. You can think of a VIN number on a card that's very specific. There is a specific definition of how that goes. So there are many, many more types of identifiers that you could have for your product and that you could add. So that's one of the things we could do to add to Northwind. But for the purposes of this application, we have this product code, which is our SKU. Here we're talking about what's the product, what category does it go in, what is its description. When we look here at the lower left, quantity per unit, unit price, unit cost, re-level, reorder level, target level, minimum reorder quantity, all of those are kept on the product record itself. So if you hover, if you click in one and hover, it's kind of clicking fast there, you should see number of items in the container, informational only, not used in any calculation. So we put the definitions in for you to be able to see what these are. The unit price is what we're going to sell the almonds for. The cost is what we pay. 
the reorder level says it's 30. So when you get down to having only 30, they would like to start doing the reorder process. The target level is 20, meaning we always want to have 20 in stock at all times. The vendor has said that the minimum reorder quantity is five. So we can't order less than five. We must order five at a minimum. These numbers over on the lower right, available to sell, how much is in no stock, how much has been allocated, how much is on order, and how much do we need to place a reorder for. All of this is calculated real time. And we'll get to that calculation in a brief second here. So when we look, we see that we have two product vendors. In the real world, you would have probably varying unit costs. What your vendor is selling it to you for would be different. You would have credit terms. There are a lot of additional data points around the vendor that you would most likely be capturing. Um, what is their turnaround time? Meaning you have to understand your supply chain. What are your payment terms with them? Do you have a prepay that you work against? Can you make partial payments? Are your terms net 30? Do you pay before they will deliver? How, how does that how does that work for that particular vendor? So let's begin talking about how inventory works in Northwind. So we have the concept of a stock take, which came from Alan Brown. And if you were to click on this yellow icon here, which I could do, but in the name of time, it will take you to the documentation for the product form. And if we scroll down in here, all of Northwind's rules about inventory are defined. Whatever process you choose to have, whatever your business rules are, they need to be clearly documented and then you need to follow them strictly. Otherwise your inventory process isn't really going to work, nor will any other business process that you create in your app, whether it has to do with inventory or not. The concept of a stock take comes from Alan Brown and we make reference to him in the code and so his concept of this, an easy way to do inventory was to do a stock take to then count how much you had bought plus minus how much you have sold. And that would tell you how much you have on hand. There's no updating the tables real time with my, subtracting five from how many you have, adding six back. None of that happens. It gets calculated all the time. One of the improvements you might make to this or a change, I don't know if it's necessarily an improvement, but it could be a change. Maybe you can only afford to physically go and count inventory once a year. There is a cost to that. Usually uh, many factories, warehouses shut down so that the counting can occur without the numbers being kind of a moving target that you're not shipping out of this facility while you're trying to count because then it's not easy to get an accurate count. But one of the things you could do is add another field to the stock take table that indicated whether this was a physical count or let's say a logical count. So you could choose at the end of each month to do the mathematics to say, how much do I have available to sell by taking what was the last stock take? How much did I buy in this time frame? How much did I sell? And that's how much I expect to find on the shelf. You could create your own stock take with a different definition than the one we put into Northwind that would be very performant, right? It would only be looking at the last 30 days instead of potentially the last 10 or 12 months, depending on how far you are into your cycle. When we look at purchase orders, so where we are right now with Northwind was our very first purchase order went out on January 29th as we prepared to open the doors in February and we ordered 40. We have a second purchase order that went out for yellow vendor on February 2nd, because we started having a lot of orders come in and we added another 20. So in total from our orders, we have 60. If we look at our customer orders, customer orders in Northwind get filled on a first come first serve basis, which is what you would want. The first person who ordered, you would attempt to fill their order first and continue down the chain. What we see here is of the 60, 39 went for order number one, and its status for this particular product is allocated. Let's look at the actual order. So in Northwind, 
we are keeping track of the status of each item that the customer has requested. And there are a number of statuses that can be assigned. There's no stock, meaning we don't have any, and we don't have any on order. It could be, well, we could fill this, but the merchandise is on order. We have not received it yet. Allocated means we physically have it on the shelf and we can ship it. Invoiced and shipped happens as it moves through the workflow, which we identified here at the top. Create an invoice, ship the order, receive the payment, close the order. The order overall has a status, which is new, but each of these line items can be in a different state depending on where they are. Northwind currently has a defined business practice that says we do not do partial shipment. So if you wanted 100 almonds, we wouldn't send you 39 and wait to send you the other 61. That's our business model. You could change your business model and say we do do partial shipments. You could also choose to say, well, if I can't ship everything, I want to split off what I can ship and get it, that out the door. So let's take a moment and think about if we were going to split the order because everything was not available, how would we do that? Well, because it's first come, first serve, you would want to leave the almonds on this order. Let's say we couldn't fill the almonds. We would want to leave this. And the items that we could ship, we would split off into a new order and get them out the door for the customer as soon as possible. That's one way to split an order. We would want to leave almonds in this order because this order keeps its place in line for the fulfillment when the product does come in. So we would, if we split off the almonds because that was the one thing we couldn't ship, they would get moved further down the line. And that really isn't what we want to experience for our customer. So here we have our second order and you can see that it says there's no stock, but number 17 is allocated. Well, okay, because I did have enough to fulfill the order for 14, but I did not have enough for 29 and I didn't hold up the 21 that we had for this order and not allow this order to be filled. So that's a concept as you work through the inventory that you need to keep in mind. It's first come, first serve, and until the order itself moves to a status of invoice, the products can be changed, who they're allocated to. So let's look at this. Let's go to here and say, well, you're on the phone, the customer calls in and you say, well, I, let me see if I, if I only take 10 almonds, now they're allocated to me and my whole order's allocated and it could go out. Let's look at almonds and see what actually happened here. Well, order 16 got filled and now order 17, which had 14 is says no stock when a few minutes ago it said allocated. That's because order 16 changed in order to, and we can open more than one version of the order window here, I forgot that, changed their mind and said, I'll take 10, just let me get it out the door. I'll call you back for the others. That's how it changes. So how did all of this actually happen? How did I just update this row, the almonds, and suddenly order 17 looks different? We'll take a look at the code. So before that, I wanna point out we have, um, we have line numbers in our code, and there was some discussion about that and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And as with all things, it's not just one answer. It depends on your perspective and what you want from it. In order to remove the line numbers, you're going to need some code or a tool. If you Google search, remove line numbers in VBA, you will find code that will do that for you. And I believe that code is also will add the line numbers if that's what you want to do. I think they're, both of those options are up there. I want to point out though, that I use a tool called MZ Tools. I received nothing from them for telling you about this. They don't even know who I am, I'm sure. Um, this Code Explorer window that you're looking at is part of that. That's You're seeing something different than what you tried to do this without the tool. MZ Tools also has a feature that will allow you to add and remove the line numbers, which many developers uh, utilize this tool. It's not very expensive in my opinion, which of course that's an opinion. Um, it's somewhere between 85 and 90 US dollars. So to me as a consultant, a dollar an hour for two weeks is well worth my money than me figuring out how to do all the things that this tool already does for me. So 
with that, I'm going to close this and we're going to look at the inventory module. So we're in the inventory module and we have code called allocate inventory and that's how this happens. So what I'm going to do is, and this is also part of the MZ tools, but I want you to see this. I'm going to find this text throughout my project. And now we can clearly see all the places that allocate inventory gets called. So it gets called from form order details. And that happens when there's a delete. You, so here in one place, you can see all of the code, which actually allocates inventory from within Northwind. And it's a lot of places. And um, if you don't use these kind of tools, you can create documentation to uh, capture this. Um, to me, obviously another personal opinion, I prefer looking at the code rather than paper documentation that has been created because once the documentation on, is on paper, it, become, it can become obsolete. So I really want to know truthfully what's happening in my application. Reallocate inventory, calls, allocate inventory. So here are all of the different code modules and I can click on one of these and it will take me to that code. And I can go back to the code I was in. So we can move around. So let's look at how this actually works. So here on line 20, we're creating a SQL string, which we're going to talk about in, Tom's going to talk about in the next piece. He will go over string functions that are provided within Northwind. What's good about this is it lets you stop thinking about how to write the SQL string and how to get it properly formatted so that you can then use it to open your record set. Starting at line 40, we're going to find out how much is available. So that was that number seven that we saw on the inventory portion for almonds. We're calling a function here and that function um, does one thing. So it says, and it calls a bunch of other functions. So when you create a, a module that's going to do a lot of math, when you have a lot of math in your application, you wanna control that in a single library so that the calculation is done the same way all the time for everyone, instead of every screen that's using it, doing the calculation for you. This allows us to have one definition, and if we have an error or something's wrong in our calculation, we fix it in one place and everybody benefits from it. So that's what we're doing here. So the first thing is we want to know what was the last stock take? When was the last time we physically went and counted inventory? We need to know the date and time matters because as things are moving through the workflow, the timing is important. So it doesn't matter that I counted the stock on Tuesday. That's not good enough. What time did I count it? Well, I counted it at noon and I was taking orders in the morning. If I only looked at the date, I might look at the order and say, well, why didn't my order get filled? We had enough stock. Well, we had enough stock at noon. We may not have had enough stock when you took the order. So time is a critical part of this particular process. What was the quantity that we last got when we physically counted it? Sold for us, the definition of sold is when the product, the order goes to invoice. It's not sold until then. Until we generate the invoice, that product has not been sold and can be reallocated. It's considered bought when we receive the goods. Just because we've placed an order and sent it out doesn't mean we have the product. For Northwind, the product has to enter the facility and it gets moved to the shelf. So when it's received, we consider it bought. And here's Alan's calculation. How much is available is how much did we have the last time we took a physical count? How much have we bought since then? And how much have we sold? That will tell us how much is available. And that's how you get the product available. There are many other calculations in here. I don't necessarily need to read them to you. We have attempted to document those. If we could be more clear or more concise, or you found something could be worded better, we'd 
uh, like to hear it. The thing I also should say is we cannot release a new template whenever we want to, like every week. We have to go to Microsoft. We have to get involved with the team there that creates the ACCDT and does the deployment. So we are not on, Northwind 2 is not on anybody's work schedule at Microsoft. Everyone who helped us throughout this process squeezed us in, did it at lunch. We had people helping us on the weekends. It was really amazing to see how many people were willing to um, help us get this done, even though we weren't in their already busy workday. So that was really refreshing to see their commitment to that. So stock take dates, there are a number, how much is available, how much did we buy, dates, so that all of that information that we saw on the screen here is calculated real time. And we can see that it now says I have 11 to sell because I changed order 16 to 10 and I only need to reorder 47. We also, we're low on almonds. We know that because the reorder level is highlighted at 30 and I only have 11 to sell. So in Northwind, the reorder levels turning yellow is a flag that says to you, you need to reorder because we only were, were either at or below 30. That reorder level would be defined by someone in the company that is aware of the supply chain. How long does it take a vendor to get the almonds to us so that we always have 20 on the shelf? They know that lag time. They know how often you sell almonds. In the beginning for a new company, it's really bumpy. Something turns out to be super fabulously popular and you had no idea it was gonna be that product and you don't have enough on the shelves and your vendors who make it for you are gearing up and having to do what they need to on their end for their supply chain to get the raw goods and materials that they need to give you your products. So that's what the reorder level does. An improvement you could make is you could automatically cause the product to reorder when the reorder trips. You would have to build a process that each time the allocate inventory occurred, you would check to see how many were available to be sold and then make the decision to uh, create a reorder or not. But let's look at if we did the reorder ourselves. So we have a button here on the application to reorder the product. So I'm going to say I'm going to pick brown vendor and I now have a new order. And we can see that the order is 47. It suggests by doing the calculation how many we need because it's right here. We need 47. But I know we like to have 30 on the shelf. And if I just order the 47, I'm going to be back at only having 20 on the shelf, not 30 or more. So I may decide to say, well, I want to order 75 because I want to make sure we have plenty. The almonds are moving faster than I thought they would be. We would then submit the PO. We're going to set the status that's been submitted. We require an approval, an improvement you could make to this particular process or a change, I should say, is under a certain dollar threshold, an approval is not required, or approvals are not required for certain products, only some products, like maybe the beer, because the beer goes really fast at Northwind. I'm going to approve the PO. It says, oh, I don't have privileges. I can't do that. I need to sign in as Andrew, or I need to give myself permission. And I'm going to go to privileges, and I'm going to put in me. I gave myself permission, which in a production application, you would not be able to give yourself permission. And I'm now going to approve the PO. The status has been set. I'm now going to receive it. It's going to tell me I'm ready to post it to inventory. And I'm going to say yes. And the new status has been set to received. If I look back now, suddenly I have a reorder of five. I have 48 to sell. I have a reorder of 30 and a target level of 20. And here's my new PO. What happened to my orders then? Well, suddenly everyone is now allocated and can get their almonds. So that's what happened here. So one of the things you could do is you, sh you would most likely have to implement barcode for scanning purposes so that you could count without having people typing in the amounts or doing things like that. You would want to 
update potentially the orders to shipped when it is at the dock and someone could scan it when it got put on the truck and it would move the status to say, oh, now the order's been shipped. We would, we could automate the purchase order to received when it got scanned in on the dock, even though somebody hadn't maybe physically carried it to the shelf yet, whatever we wanted our rule to be. We could also be sending the customer orders the customer who placed the order for our customers, sending them emails, keeping them posted, just like you get from your favorite online shopper that tells you your order's been shipped. I'm sorry, it's running late, whatever's happening, that you could automate all of those processes yourself. So what we have today is George Hepworth is going to share with us a scanning app that he built. And I'm going to stop sharing so George can um, he's going to show us an app that he put together using Power Apps. We actually scan the products from Northwind in. So, George, are you ready? I think so. No, I'm sorry. I'm fumbling with the buttons. I'm actually on my iPhone. Uh, are you seeing the app now? Yes. Okay, so I'm actually on my iPhone because I need the barcode scanner, which is built into the smart device to, to do the barcode scanning. Uh, what I have here is an application which does one thing. It's a hybrid app because this interface connects to the same data source as the access front end does. It does one thing, which is collect information about inventory on, on the shelves in the warehouse. I built it with some options. I won't go through these in too much detail. Because it's a virtual app, I can put the keypad on the right or the left. If you're a left-hander, you may want it on the left. Default is on the right. Uh, one thing that I don't know if Kim mentioned this or emphasized it, but file shrinkage or shrinkage, you know, is is an issue with inventory. Things get broken, they get lost, they get they walk out the door. So in our inventory, we, we're going to allow for up to 5% variance between what we actually count in our inventory and what we expect to find based on our calculations. I have a backup version, which uses strictly the keypad, but the one we're going to look at is the scanner. So when the scanner is ready to go, I have on the left a gallery, and the gallery is uh, an equivalent structure to a continuous view form in the access world. It has a record source and each individual record can be selected. And you can see the conditional highlighting indicating that. I have it set up so that I can filter it to show only how many products remain to be scanned, how many altogether. The barcode that I created is actually based on the Northwind product. I called it an SKU because as Kim pointed out, it's closer to the concept of an SKU in this environment. So I'm just going to go ahead and click the barcode and that triggers the barcode scanner in the phone. I have discovered by practicing that I have to be well, see, it already grabbed my almonds, even though I was still talking about the form. It brought in the almonds, it focused on that, and it's ready to accept the quantity. So in this case, I'm going to say I counted the products on the shelf, I counted the boxes of almonds, and there are exactly 60. So I used my keypad to enter that, save it, and it updates my on hand to 60, which is highlighted in green to indicate that it now matches my expected. I can't show you the access side of this because I can only share one screen at a time. But if I look back at my access database, I can see that my doc take quantity is now 60 in real time in the access interface. I mentioned the variance. If I say that instead of 60, I count 55. Now my on hand and expected are highlighted in red to indicate that I am outside my 5% allowable shrinkage. And I'll do 56. And that should indicate, well, I'm still red, I'm gonna do 58. Okay. Now it shows up in orange. I used orange instead of yellow because the yellow doesn't really work well in this, in this inter interface. That means that I am not exactly matching on the on hand that I counted and what I expected but I'm still within my 5% variance. You can use that information in a couple of different ways. You could set this up with a flow 
that would automatically notify the sales manager when your shrinkage is outside of the acceptable limits. You could create a report in the access side that would list all your products that are on, on the nose, those that are off by some amount, but less than the allowable shrinkage, and those that are outside of our shrinkage for, for follow-up actions. That's pretty much the extent of this application because it's only intended to do this one thing. And I will turn the time back to Kim. If you're interested in how this works, we can talk about that at a different time. Well, I thought you were going to do a presentation on that, George, what, what or another I, group. Uh, we have a couple of options for that, yeah. If, if nothing else works out, I will probably do a presentation in October for the access-specific group. Okay, Tom. You're up and you can drive. I want to start, I'm going to be talking about the string functions now. We have a number of ways we've implemented some really cool string functions that I've already heard from feedback that some people are already refactoring their own code to say, hey, this is actually pretty cool. You, you might want to take a look at this to see if, if this could help you as well. Scenario number one, we are deleting an employee. And of course, referential integrity rules are in place to prevent that from happening because this person is the sales rep on uh, six orders, apparently. And so we actually do a pre-scan. We don't really want to show you the ugly access message. We want to show you something a little bit more user-friendly. Uh, and this dialogue is one of the ways that we did that. This is a very generic dialogue that we created one of, and then we pass in some open arcs to indicate how the dialogue should configure itself, um, such as what is the title going to be, what's the body text, which buttons uh, should show up. That is the first thing that I want to take a look at to see how we did that. So if we go back to the code and we look at our generic dialogue, actually, let's look at the employees form. You're on it employee list, that's right. And there is a delete event, which is where we do that test, right? We are only gonna allow delete if the employee has nothing uh, associated with them. And so if we step into that, the uh, code is right down here, then we will see the use of open arcs. Open arcs is being concatenated here and then passed into the document open form of the generic dialogue. And how do, are we doing that concatenation? There's two concepts here that I want you to take away. The first one is when I was a rookie, I would open a form and let's say I needed to pass in a job ID or whatever it is, just document open form, blah, 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 seven, whatever my job ID was. Later, I realized that self-describing is a good idea. The idea here of the format came from the query string. If you look at any browser, any query string, it is a collection of name value pairs. Header equals zero and message equals one. Those are name value pairs. And so we have named our argument. This is especially important if you're passing in more than one. If I was to pass in seven vertical bar 23, you would have to go read the code to understand what that seven is. Is it the job ID or is it the customer ID? And so by naming it, you have immediate documentation. It's self-documented. So that's one thing you want to take away. I will look at string format here in a moment, but uh, I want to look at generic dialogue and see how we are then using that incoming string and picking it apart. That's what we're doing here. So open ours is being passed into a function that we also wrote, string to dictionary, and that creates a dictionary object. We have a reference to the scripting library. And its dictionary object is essentially a, co a collection of name value pairs with a few handy other functions like the keys collection of the collection. Um, there's an exist method. All these things you get for free that you wouldn't have to implement yourself or you know, write other code. So we decided that the dictionary object was going to be our friend. So the entire argument is being broken up and then parsed into, you can see it here. The form caption is one of the elements. It's whatever the form caption element was, whatever the header piece was, is now going to be an SDR header. And then that information is then used, of course, to set the caption, set the message, etc. So 
what you take away here is the, the use of the dictionary object in conjunction with a query string like way of passing openers. Now let's take a look at the third element of, of the presentation uh, about strings, which is uh, a collection of functions and string format is one of them. And, and the idea here is to make it easier for you to concatenate strings. I can't tell you how many times I've seen code in the forums from usually beginners who royally mess up string concatenation. It is difficult, single quotes, double quotes, ampersands, two double quotes, three double quotes. It gets complicated. Even more experienced developers sometimes mess this up. This set of functions takes that away altogether. That in itself is a benefit, so yay. But what it also does, and I think that's more important, is it allows you to focus on the string, the message, the SQL statement, that you want to create without having to worry about how to escape values, how to concatenate the string element. Because for me, at least, when I read this, I know immediately what it is that I'm passing it. I don't have to go parse code and skip over little ampersands and underscore line continuations at, at the end. And none of that is, is necessary here. You just focus on the message and let the string format function do its work. So in this case, string format is a function, we'll step into it in a second, that takes a string in a certain format with the curly bracket zero, one, two, three, however many arguments you have, it's up to you. And then the variable number of arguments are passed in as well. And of course, number one goes into the zero, etc. That in itself is, is super nice. And the string format function does its, it's not magic. It's, it's, it's a feature of PBA, but not everyone is perhaps aware of it. There is the param array, which basically gives you the ability to pass in zero or more parameters, as many as you want. And they become an array, and you can then use them to fill your, in my case, curly bracket number, close curly bracket, with whatever was passed in as a value. So that is also nice. Now, we want to use this kind of function in a couple of different ways. Um, oh, I should probably just demo this for you one more time so that you have the concept. Hello, zero, this is one. That is really the message that we are trying to convey, right? And we don't have to worry about how exactly to put the words work and ET uh, in it. I'm assuming these are variables, right? A couple of ways you can then build on this feature. The first one that I wanna talk about is if I can get back to my access window, we have a table with strings and we're doing the same thing here. Hello, zero, this is one. Please enter a number between zero and one. Are you sure you want to permanently delete this, whether it's a customer or an order or whatever? Confirm the deletion of X. We are using this to ad our advantage here as well. One of the functions we're doing is in conjunction with message box. So we will have something like message box, get string, some ID value. That ID value is, of course, the ID value of the string table. Any arguments that you may want to pass in. And so message box get string um, will then use that exact same string format function after it looks up the string that you're interested in and pass that on to the string format function, which then does the parameter replacement and life is good. It returns that to the message box statement as, as the body of the message. So that is a really nice way to reuse the string format function and have a really nice string table with replaceable parameters. The other way we're using it is when we're formatting a SQL statement. Maybe I should use an example first here and let's just look at some of the places where we're using that. I'm using MC tools again to get a list of them. Okay, there they are. She knew what I wanted. Okay, this one, for example. String format SQL. Insert into MRU. You don't even know what the MRU table is, but it doesn't really matter. Employee ID, da, 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 values, zero, one, two, three. And so here we have another example of 
being focused on, in this case, the SQL statement. If you write SQL pretty well, you can understand this insert statement, right? Into the table name, then the field names within parentheses, then the word values, and then again within parentheses, the comma separated values. Those values need to be escaped properly. For example, this date added value needs to be surrounded by hash marks uh, if we are doing access SQL or single quotes if we're doing T-SQL with SQL Server. And so string format SQL, yes, it's nice that it helps you with concatenation, but I would argue to you that this is super readable as this is a valid SQL statement. I can read this and understand it. This works the first time versus if all the values, et cetera, and the escape characters had to be added to it, it's just a lot more messy. It's not as easy to follow what exactly the SQL statement is. And so I believe that, that that is a benefit. And so what we're doing in this function then is we are doing the escaping for you. So we're looking at the var type, let's say a VBA function that tells us that this parameter that you passed in, maybe parameter zero uh, is a string and therefore it needs to be escaped with single quotes. This other parameter for three that you passed in is a date and has to be escaped with hash mark. So again, you write this code once, or in your case, you're borrowing this entire module mod strings and you just start using it. This is where centralizing these kinds of functions into a single module, giving them some, some power by using param array. Yes, there's a finer point here that I'm afraid I don't have time for. It has to do with if a param array is passed to another function that takes a param array, things are a little funky, but otherwise, oh, and we have to deal with null. That's always interesting. You can, it's not here um, because we're not doing a SQL Server backend, but you can now imagine string format T-SQL becoming part of your code library, where whether it's a string or a date, we escape with a single quote and everything else is probably the same. And then you can use that just the same way as, as in with the access to SQL. Tom, can you point out the date function that we put in to support the other regions? Yes. Th there was a little bit of an embarrassing uh, moment after we released Northwind 2.0. Within minutes, we had a couple of people from uh, Germany um, contacting us and saying, this don't work so well. And so we said, oh my goodness, how could we ever have forgotten about the world outside of the United States, where perhaps dates are not formatted the same way that Access expects it. So we did indeed have to go back and add this to Access date function. And in places where we are passing in a date into that string function, for example, we're wrapping that with this function call so that it is indeed in a format that Access likes. I believe this is like an ISO kind of standard that, that Access likes. It also likes the, the US format, but it seemed a little bit more universal. So that is in, in the current shipping version. That was a scramble, scramble. And two days later, we had a, the new version in place. Everyone has this function already uh, as part of them. So it should work for you in, in Germany and other locales, I believe. But that kind of completes this section. Thank you, Tom. Kim, do you, do you have anything you want to add before I go on to any questions? Uh, the one thing I want to point out is it all, uh, Tom, I'm, I think you said last time, it's going to be a couple more months before we can do another deployment. So I just want to make you aware that we can't deploy anywhere every time we want to. The other thing is the team did this as a bunch of volunteers, and we would love for anything you develop or do that, if you can, because it's not proprietary to your company, share it so that other people can learn from it too. We are all ambassadors for access. And if we want it to be accepted and found, we need to show how to do these things. And hopefully we've given you a simple enough starting point that you can then adapt it with your ideas and and share them with everybody else because that's really important to us. We we hope you'll all do that. That's all I have, Colin. Thank you ever so much. I'd like to thank all of you, Kim, George, and Tom for giving an excellent presentation. And also the two other members of the team, George Young and Dawn Taylor, who also contributed to this amazing project. And I think you must have spent hundreds of hours on this. 
And I think you said that you're ask, well, not asking, you're encouraging people to expand on this and develop it in ways that are useful to them and then to publish those. Inevitably, there are things that everyone would do differently. There's a couple of comments inevitably about line numbers, uh, having them or not having them. I won't go through that again now. Jeff asked a question about how the iPhone connects to access back end, but that was answered by George in the chat. There were several questions about the string function. If I can just quickly say, Jeff asked whether the string functions can be used in multi-language apps, for example, English, French, or Arabic, non-Latin characters. Tom, are you able to answer that? Certainly all European languages, etc., that should just work if you're in a right to left language, such as Arabic or Hebrew. I frankly, that's outside of my area of expertise. I would say, try it and let us know. And if, the, if there are changes that you would like to make, we would certainly consider that because we, we'd like for everyone to be able to use them. If, if for example, the zero, one, two, three needs to be in the reverse order, it's not out of the realm of possibilities to, to, to change that. I think having done, as you know, a partial translation of Northwind into other languages, it's not completed. I think the answer is yes, it can be done. And I can happily discuss that with you outside of this meeting, if you like. Neil asked, could you show the code that passes the parameters to a called function? Yeah. She said was brilliant. I thought you did that though. String format SQL passes on the params to string format in line 180. So that is an example of where we're passing the parameters to another function. Yeah, a few years ago, I tried to, uh... I tried to solve that issue and failed. And to see the solution here was wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, yeah, Neil. The solution is in line 20. Right. Does anyone have any other questions? If you do... Yeah, I did have one other question, actually, if you could. Oh, sorry. I thought that was your question, Neil. Sorry. No. Very quickly, it was, if you could. In your get string function that you call this string format from, you're using enums to identify the strings in your table. Correct. I just wonder what the decision behind using enums was, because if you use a string as the key, it would be self-maintaining and self-documenting. You wouldn't need to have the enums at all. Is, yeah. it, is it because can of... Can you uh, go to, all the way to the top of this module? That's where they are defined. Yeah, uh, you're right. I realize that. You, you, you can use a key that is a short string that basically would be something like hello world and number between, and then you could use that. I like integer primary keys. That is part of the reason. Uh, also, we are using enums throughout. If you go to mod global, towards the top of mod global, we have several more en enums there. It is a good way to... It's it's a great way of, uh, numbers, of uh, documenting uh, numeric keys. Yeah, but you're right. You, you, there's nothing wrong with using a, a, a text key in this particular case. We also made a decision that the table would have numeric primary keys so that if you thought about you know, we were having fantasy conversations about Northwind SQL and the band getting back together to create a version that interacted with SQL Server as the back end. And those primary keys are most performant. So that was part of our discussion about what the keys should be. Uh, in Northwind 1, uh, a few primary keys are uh, text and we did away with that. Thank you ever so much again, you both, all of you, for what you've presented today and indeed for stepping in at very short notice when I had a problem with the June session. Perfect timing, I think. And next month, in a complete change of topic, we have Alexander Voitas, who was due originally to present last December. And I'm pleased to say that the issues outside his control uh, that prevented that happening then are now solved. And Alexander is going to be showing something that I know a lot of you have seen over the years, and that is interactive Gantt chart scheduler. Very clever code. Alexander, are you able to speak? And would you like to share your screen? Yeah. Right, over to you, Alexander. Uh, please let me know if you can see my we screen. We can. Yes, we can. All right. So uh, it is a little demonstration of how it looks because it is the solution I have developed a couple of years ago and I'm using uh, with success uh, already a couple of years. So it's a pretty mature solution. It is not very standard use of Microsoft Access because behind there is a graphical library that is uh, drawing the uh, pictures in their lifetime. This 
connected together with the mouse move events. And uh, as a result, we can see the interactive Gantt chart and all the data are kept in Access database as uh, regular tables, but are presented uh, on the form of the uh, horizontal calendar line. And on the vertical line, we can see anything we wish. There may be some resources, there may be some persons, and so on. And I will uh, make some little demonstration how we can use this uh, drag and drop functionality because it is most interesting because uh, this is uh, showing uh, we can in the immediate uh, moment react when we see some collisions we can uh, move some uh, some of the things uh, and still observing how it uh, is in uh, interaction with other uh, activities so this one is some kind of a little track planner so we can assume we have tracks we have calendars we can uh, have these rectangles as the uh, orders of transportation. So we can, of course, uh, put some details, maybe some little comment, and of course the the details are visible here. Uh, so it is one of the uh, sample application. Uh, other one is a sample production. So we have uh, some of the uh, production elements. We have the operation of uh, production. We can move them. And here is also some feature that is detecting collisions. So we can move when one, one of the operations is moving uh, forward. So it is pushing forward the subsequent operations. Later, I have some one more demonstration. Uh, we can assume this one is kind of uh, personal task planner. So we can we can have an uh, of the of the things we can uh, extend the. Um, the rectangles as we wish. It can occupy a whole uh, the row or only partial of the row. Some of them may be in parallel. So, so it is this solution is very flexible. And as you wish, there is zoom in and zoom out uh, uh, feature. So we can we can see more than uh, than one month. Or we can we can adjust the the zoom as only we wish so so it is also and maybe i will make some little demonstration that it is really microsoft access so i'm uh, showing this is a full menu and when we go to the design mode there is nothing there there is just empty image uh, image control and all the picture is drawn in the real time but all the details will be revealed uh, during the next session on first uh, Wednesday of July. Thank you ever so much. Hope that's given a good teaser for next month's session there. Um, it's amazing that one product, Access, can produce such massively different applications. Yours, Northwind, and many of the other things that we've seen over the last few months. At this point then, thank you to everybody. The page for Alexander's is not yet online on my website, uh, but it will be in the next few days. And going back to the previous slide, you, there is no PDF available today. The Northwind templates, if you aren't aware, you can download them direct from the backstage view in Access, though there is also a direct URL that you can download both editions. Okay, thank you everyone then. I hope to see you all next month. And thank you again for all the presenters today. You've given us a lot to look at. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Bye now. You thank you, Colin, thank you. Kim, and Tom. Thank you, Crystal. Make us look good in the video. <laughs> yeah, well, that will be up to Colin. No, it's me doing the <laughs> Oh, okay.